and welcome to the University of Warwick and our ESRC Festival of Social Sciences discussion event on global challenges requ re requiring global collaboration. My name is Emily Little and I work at the Warwick Institute of in Ed Engagement. Please do sit back wherever you are watching in the world and enjoy what sounds like a fascinating discussion. If you have any comments and questions, please do use the chat box to let us know where you're watching from and what you'd like to ask. You can tweet us at Warwick Engages using the hashtag ESRC Festival. And you can join further online festival events from Warwick on our YouTube channel all this week. But for now, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's chair, Michaela Flores Lanza. Hello, Michaela. Hi, hi, Emily. How are you? Thank you very I'm good. much. How are you? Please do take us through this evening. Thank you. Well, good Sunday to everyone. My name is Micaela Flores and I will be chairing this last panel. The name is What Sustainable Policies Are Being Implemented in Developing Countries? Thanks to everyone for joining this panel. I hope you, you enjoy it. And we have three interesting speakers today. I was going to start with uh, Miss Aris Scarlett Abalco, but she's having some connection problems, so we will start with Yomar Ferrino Lanza. She's a Bolivian an Andean philosopher and cyber activist in Nietos de las Montañas group. Yomar proposes to implement in post-pandemic modernity an alternative economic model of the trick based on a fair economic that values individual skills, goods, and services. Envisioning the future, Yomar hopes to stop relying on, this, on the use of uh, social um, fossil fuels that damage in the Mother Earth. She believes that the industrial age must be adjusted to, to some natural cycles in the new century and the new pandemic. Uh, please, Yomar, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Uh, your volume, we, we cannot hear you, Yomar. Please, can you? Yomar, no podemos escucharte. Yomar, could you just unmute your microphone? We can't hear you. Yomar, puedes eh, prender tu micrófono, por favor, para que podamos escucharte. Ya. Ok, ya te escucho. Ahora sí. Ya, eh, también necesitamos darle sonido al intérprete, por favor. Por eso voy a apagar el micrófono. Uh, Emily, please, can we uh, give sound to the interpreter, Lorena? So, yeah, thank you. Gracias, Yamar. Puedes silenciarte y te escucho aquí. Okay. Good afternoon. I would like to thank everyone for the opportunity of being here today. I am honored to participate in this important event. And I would like to talk about what something is uh, a, quite a matter of death or life. It's taking care of Mother Earth. I am an environmental cyber activist at Nietos de las Montañas. And through this movement, I would like to work in favor of the protection of Mother Earth and in the promotion of Andean philosophy. Now, the idea is to promote this way of understanding of life that our ancestors used to have.
They were aware about the fact that Mother Earth was an ancestor of ours. That is, that is why it's called Mother Earth. The mountains were our grandparents. Andean culture respects Mother Earth and nature because we are well aware of the fact that they are ans our ancestors. They were here even before the creation uh, and the existence of humankind. That is why we, ven we venerate the mountains, the sun, the earth, and the moon. This ancestral philosophy that is well known by our grandparents and by our predecessors is of utmost importance because they were dedicated to agriculture and that is why they had a deep understanding of the natural cycles of the planet that were led by the moon's cycles as well. This is why it is so important to maintain this know-how and this wisdom. Our ancestors led their way of life according to the different seasons. They carried out specific ceremonies and rites depending on the equinox and on the solstice. And this shows that our ancestors have a scientific know-how. This is not something they pulled out of nowhere. This is based on scientific facts because it is based on natural occurring phenomena. Our ancestors, our grandparents, knew the fact that there are forces that change our world. And they were aware of these changes. They carried out their agricultural cycles in different seasons. As you know, we have the different agricultural cycles. There was one that started in March and went until June. There was a second one that was called the wet season that started in February, and sorry, in September and continued until February. And that is why they had different cycles. They had the cycle of man, the cycle of the women, the flowering cycle, but they also were aware of the fact that there were resting cycles, cycles where it was necessary to let things stand and rest. And and that is why they did not use agro-industrial product. They knew that there was a natural cycle to life.
Our grandparents, whom we call the abuelos, had a good knowledge of development in genetics, and they practiced genetic developing in fruit crops. Even before colonialism, there were uh, 4,000 different species, different varieties of potatoes. Potatoes didn't exist in Europe um, before colonial times. But even in those times, we had 4,000 different varieties. And n even 200 years ago, there were still 2,000 different varieties that existed. It is thanks to this technological knowledge, this technological development created by our ancestors that we were able to have a great variety of food. And this was all developed without mistreating or harming Earth. This happened, as I told you, many years ago, and it was without the use of any toxins in our crops. We have the necessary means to be able to guarantee food sovereignty without undermining the health of our earth. Our ancestors knew to how to create uh, crops and how to manage them in a natural way. They were able to harvest and grow a great variety of coca leaves that have very many nutrients. They were also able to grow different kinds of quinoa, which are also very nutritious. And astronomers are, have for sure discovered um, their properties. And all of these were Andean cereals. And grains. They also develop the know-how to be able to dehydrate food such as potatoes, such as meat, and other different types of cereals so that they will they would last for many years. But we are about to face a new colonization period, and this worries us deeply. China is interested in, violating, in buying meat and pork and chicken from uh, Bolivia and from the Andean culture. And we are concerned because we have a lot of seeds that have not yet been affected by industrialization. We have a great uh, variety of biodiversity and plants, endemic varieties. And these seeds are very important for feeding the entire world.
We have been blessed by because we have been given an earth that has all the necessary minerals and nutrients in order to provide ourselves with food. And right now, we need to understand. Uh, we undertake a struggle. We need to understand that we need to change our way of life. We need to learn and share with the rest of the world that our relationship with, with nature should be reciprocal. Of course, we can receive, yes, but we must also be able to give and we must be able to respect Mother Earth and nature and m must take only what we need. We will also like to promote the barter system that our ancestors used to use because we are aware of the fact that each human being has specific skills that they can share with others. Each one provides different things that we can trade with one another in order to complement ourselves. Capitalism has turned human beings into just employees, just workers, and it has led us to forget the value that our hard work has. We must turn back to exchanging with one another and become aware of how important nature is. We must share these ancestral values and to really realize how much our hard work is worth. This, again, will be able to be carried out through reciprocal exchange and through the valuing of human work. I would like to close by sharing the philosophy of uh, respect against mother towards Mother Nature that my ancestors, both Quechua and Aramaras, used to have. I would like to close with one final message. Let us please look back to the way that our ancestors 
worked the land and how they treated Mother Earth. Let's look at Mother Earth as not as a resource from whom we just take away. Earth is our mother. Animals are our brother and sisters, and they must not just be exploited. They must not be seen as something that we consume and something from which we take everything away. We must strive to find a balance with our land, and we must try to build um, a reciprocal way of life, reciprocal both materially but also spiritually. So, for example, if you plant a tree, think of plant, if you cut a tree, sorry, think of planting one as well and let's protect our land from exploitation and try to take care of all the resources that we have let's take care of our air and our earth and this is the message that i would like to share with everyone it is an ancestral one and i thank you for your attention Michaela, you need to unmute your microphone. Okay, thank you, Yomar. Uh, I'm sure people got very interested in your in your speech about Mother Earth and how they have a huge impact in sustainable environment. And thank you very much. We are going to continue with uh, Addis Scarlett Abalco. She is an industrial production engineer, graduated from the University of Las Americas. And she is finishing her master's degree in logistics management at the University of La Rioja. Scarlett has extensive knowledge of statistical methods and techniques that allow perform simulations of different scenarios for a better decision making, processes optimization, demand forecast generation, patterns detection in data sets, and hypothesis testing, among many others. Welcome, Scarlett. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mikael. So, well, um, I think that uh, this moment is a great opportunity to speak uh, about a global perspective about how the sustainable politic, uh, policies that currently are being implemented in, develop, in developing countries are in a note to complement the sustainable development goals. ODS of the ONU. Um, so my intervention uh, will be based in, in ODS of the ONU. The ODS are, I think, that are essentials uh, when we talk about sustainable, um, because um, I think that uh, sustainable means a balance between economic growth in all the, the countries of the world, environment care, and social well-being. Uh, this is a sustainable for me. To me, are the, the girl of the world, these ODEs of the ONU. Um, so for this reason, I, be, I think that this is a very interesting perspective because I want to transmit you that to achieve a change the planet needs us. So we can only achieve it with the collective effort of each one of us. Um, so for this reason in my intervention, I'm going to explain uh, just, uh, we have um, 17 ODLs of the ONU, but in this case, for the literal time, I'm going to explain just eight ODLs to understand the, um, the actual situation and reality of our world according to the ONU, and that is important to, I think that it's important that we to take actions um, over this. And, and I prepare um, my my main source it was the the ONU statistics and the reports of this year. So I'm going to start in with 
the, the goal seven of the ONU, uh, that the goal seven um, is ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Um, I'm going to explain you what what happened with this and what is the reality, which is the reality uh, in this moment. In this moment with the with the COVID that obviously changed the the reality of the world and obviously um, changed everything. So um but it, it, it's important, I think, that um, before the COVID, um, all the actions that the different um, countries of the world um, are in a note to, to accomplish these goals. And this is the part, this is the part that I want to, to transmit you. So before COVID, before the the this reality, um, according to ONU, uh, the the efforts need in, in the the goal seven, the efforts need scaling up on sustainable energy. Seven uh, seven million people lack electricity. A step up efforts in renewable energy are needed. And in this part, I want to, to transmit you that only 70% share of renewables in total energy consumption. So this is a, a number very, very low. Obviously, with the, co with the COVID, it um, was very most difficult to accomplish these, these goals. Um, a part of these financial flows to better to the developing countries for renewable energy are increasing 20 24 billion in the um, in these years. So I think that this is important but only 10, 20% goes to LDEs. So the next goal that I want to expose you is the uh, number eight, is promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, fold and productive employment and decent work uh, for all. Before COVID, uh, the reality was the global economy growth was was slowing down. 20% uh, GDP per capita growth um, into years 20. Uh, excuse me, GDP per capita growth until the last year, uh, and uh, and one per one dot five percent JDP per capita ground in the in this year. So during the pandemic, one billion workers in the informal economy raised losing their livelihood. Um, and obviously uh, um, currently the world faces the worst economy recession since the Great Depression. Obviously, COVID killed. Uh, uh, obviously, um, COVID killed because the equivalent of uh, 40 million jobs losses in second quarter of this year and for the next year too. In, well, the next goal is the number nine. And this goal, I think that was very interesting because it uh, talk about the build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrial relations and forest, uh, foster innovation, excuse me. Um, and these goals um, focusing the manufacturing ground was declining. 
due to tariffs and trade tensions uh, in these years, obviously. Financing for um, it, this part is, is so interesting because uh, financial uh, for small scale industry is needed for their survival throughout the crisis. Only 35% have access to credit in developed countries. Um, investment in, is growing, but needs to accelerate this part. Yeah, the, I think that the investment is very important to the developed countries. And it's very interesting. In, well, the next goal that I'm going to tell you is the goals number 11 and talk about the make cities and human settlements inclusive sale wrestling and sustainable well in this part um is is interesting the part the share of human or human population living in Athens rose to 24 percent in the last year and it, this date is very important because only half the world's urban population has convenient access to public transport and with the covid this reality uh, was an impact and because um the majority of persons uh, in in the in the countries don't have uh, the the possibilities to to be to transportation in a, in a owned car so um this uh, these goals is focused just in this past, just in this part, because it's a reality. The world's here, urban population has convenient access to public transport, and um, this complicate uh, the with the term of pandemic of the coronavirus. So. Um, this cost to air population costs four millions premature deaths in two years ago um, for this reason 47 percent of population live within um have a comfort place to live and for other, another thing that I want to share you is the goals number 12, ensure sustainable consumptions and production patterns. Uh, before the COVID, the, the evaluation was that the world continues to use natural resource unsustainable. So I think that according to my team in this case, this goal is very important because um, if you want the rank of the different country, you can see that um, Germany, uh, Sweden, and other countries, um, they are have they. They have a progress uh, amazing in each one of these goals uh, planted for the ONU. But when you compare this rank with the other countries, like um, the, the development countries, uh, like Ecuador or like Bolivia or Africa, uh, you can see that the, these countries, for any any reasons, um, 
could be your best your best effort but no it, it isn't enough to to accomplish these goals so this is very interesting because if you if you see one by one uh, each one of the countries you can see that there are countries that have a, um, a progress amazing but if you if you see the these goals uh, the, the global form with the perspective global you can see that um is a note to to accomplish the these goals so i think that it is important to to take to see because um i can i can show that the most important is the collect collective effort and not just the individual individual um, progress because it's very important well um i'm going to continue with the, the goals that i was explaining to you uh, so in the goals number 12 that um i told you that the world continues to use natural resources unsustainable unsustainable in in 20, 2010 global material footprint uh, 773 billion metric tons and in the in the 2017 global material footprint 85 9 billion metric tons so uh, we can see with these uh, numbers that the um, the metric tons is is up <laughs> no no less no low and electrical waste grow by 34 34 a 38 percent but less than 20 is 20 percent is recycled so this there are something numbers and reality that we have currently um raising fossil fuel uh, this is a, a important a note because rising fossil fuel subsides are contributing to the climate crisis. Uh, 30, 30, uh, excuse me, <laughs> three billion in uh, four years ago and four billion uh, the uh, two years ago. So uh, it's interesting in the um, in the goals number thirteen, take urgent action. This goals I think that is very interesting because in this goals uh, talk about the uh, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Um. So um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna finish my presentation with um, with this part that um, with this note number thirteen that take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. Global community shows a way from continents required to reverse the climate crisis. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now we go to Dr. Raul uh, Pacheco Vega. He's an associate uh, professor in the Methods Lab of the Latin American Faculty for Social Sciences based in Mexico. He's a specialist in comparative public policy and focuses on North American environmental politics, primarily sanitation and water governments. 
solid waste management, neo-institutional theory, transnational environment, social movements, and experimental methods in public policy. Dr. Pacheco Vega's current research uh, program focuses on the spatial political and human dimensions on public service delivery from a comparative perspective. Thank you, doctor, you can go ahead. Thank you so much for inviting me and I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to be sharing my screen for a moment and I'm gonna show you my uh, little presentation that I did on the polycentric water government, polycentric climate government. And I just want to mention that this work is intended to showcase how Mexico is dealing with polycentric, with climate governance in the context of global climate architecture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate policy in Mexico and the two core issues that I find with the Mexican climate policy regime. The first one being the chasm between energy policy and climate policy. There is a, there, there's a bridge, there's a space between the two and there is no um, coordination and collaboration. So this is one of the one of the challenges. The second one is that there is excessive focus on education. And I'm going to talk a little bit about polycentric climate governance uh, with the work of Dr. Elena Ostrom, Vincent Ostrom, the Bloomington School, and the, the Ostrom Workshop. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about it, whether it's possible to implement polycentricity in Mexican climate policy as a thought experiment. Then I will close with the future research agenda. Traditionally, climate policy in Mexico is extraordinarily regulatory and legalistic. We have a general law for climate change. We have a strategy for a national strategy for climate change, and we have a program, a special program for climate change. But this is very much embedded in laws, which is a tradition in Mexican um, environmental politics, and it's traditionally focused on mitigation. So that means reducing carbon emissions rather than adaptation. And adaptation refers to when we focus on how we can not that the quick climate. Uh, challenges, but what we can do is we can adapt better to the potentially negative effects that this could, could have. Mexico has experimented a lot with various approaches, like the Intersecretarial Commission that seeks coherence and coordination across different agencies. So there has been some work trying to coordinate and collaborate across different agencies on climate issues. And as a continent, the North American continent has also engaged in various types of programs and projects to reduce carbon emissions. But, and since I was asked, as, through the invitation, I was asked to share some initiatives on sustainable development that were exciting. At the subnational level, we have much more exciting initiatives than at the federal level, which remains to be very legalistic. North American climate policy has a very peculiar element in North America. That's the geographical area that I'm an expert on. Whereas environmental policy convergence has been driven by NAFTA and the USMCA previously, in climate policy, we do not find climate convergence. So that means that the climate policies of Canada, the US and Mexico are very different and very divergent. So even though there are all three countries are committed to the sustainable development goals, there are profound inequities across different sectors and social strata, which make very much challenging whether or not we can implement this kind of work. So polycentricity theory has the, the great advantage that we can formulate an argument based on the importance of collaboration, cooperation, and coordination among a broad diversity of actors. Because given that climate change recognizes no frontiers or scales, it is quite important that when we do any academic analysis that has any impact on the design and implementation of public policies that target global environmental change, we need to center those public policies in collaborative and collective action paradigms. So this gives us two fundamental lessons. The first one is that the climate policy that is focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions is directly in conflict with an energy policy based on hydrocarbons. So if Mexico wants to move forward towards more green energy, we need to then coordinate the climate policy with the energy policy. We need to coordinate, collaborate, and harmonize the way in which we do policies. And finally, I want to highlight that there are some national levels of government that have started to develop 
very interesting and innovative approaches to adaptation and mitigation strategies, precisely because these will be the first ones to face these challenges. And this is a typo, it should say face with a Z. Um, one of them is, for example, the development of adaptation programs at the city level in Aguascalientes and Ciudad de Mexico. And that those happened regardless of the way in which the Mexican federal government was developing uh, whatever limited programs they have in adaptation, which is extremely limited. However, there are still very much challenges for states with high risk of abrupt climatic events, as we are seeing in the states of Chiapas and Tabasco with recent floods. My overall argument is that the Mexican climate governance architecture is just beginning to articulate in interscalar fashion from the subnational government to the international context, but it is still in its being cut short because of the extreme austerity that the Mexican government has implemented, the Lopez Obrador government has implemented. So this is this is a concern. The concern also he cut the fund then the fund fund. Uh, the, inter, the fund for disasters, and that is, that makes you know dealing with adaptation strategies much more challenging. This interscalar interaction yields interesting and innovative institutional arrangements to confront climate change, adaptation, and mitigation strategies. So these bottom-up strategies have improved substantially and emerged in next light of Mexico's fast return to a carbon-based energy policy. So Mexico City and other subnational governments have strongly pushed independently for climate policies that are more aligned with their needs. And this is logical because subnational governments will be the ones, the community, subnational communities will be the ones that deal have to deal with the challenge of climate much earlier. So I have five points on how we could implement policy and governance and make it work in Mexico. The first one is that we should seek coherent articulation and empowerment of all of So everybody needs to have a role and uh, a say in the way we design climate policy. Second, we need integration of climate and energy policy objectives. Third, we need multi-level collaborative institutional arrangements. We need to collaborate across different scales, levels, organize uh, all different powers and uh, divisions of power and levels from the federal to the municipal. Fourth, we need the carbonization strategies that emerge from non-state actors and empowered civil society organizations and some national governments. We also need business interests to continue with work on decarbonization. And fifth and final, we need to privilege science over political interests and business sectors ideologies. This is all I have. I want to thank you for the invitation. And these are my email, my website, and my Twitter account. And again, thank you very much for inviting me to the ESRC Festival of Ideas. Okay, and now. Thank you very much, Dr. Raul Pacheco Vega. And uh, now we are going to go to question and answers. Uh, first of all, I would like to address some questions to Raul Pacheco as he didn't have the chance to talk too much. So uh, we go with Fanny Ramos. Uh, she says, to what extent, um, to what extent do you think it is possible to implement a joint mitigation adaptation approach in Mexico and the region? And what's its relevance? Dr. Raul, can you hear Oh, me? is that, yeah. I didn't know if that was the question to me, sorry. Yeah, it was for you, Can uh, I will repeat it. To what extent do you think it is possible to implement a joint mitigation adaptation approach in Mexico? Okay. Okay. In Okay, that, that's that's challenge because most of the money goes to mitigation. But the, the proposal I make is, you know, it's, uh, it's important that we focus on adaptation more than on mitigation because already we have started mitigation. So it is possible to implement them, but particularly we need to implement them at the subnational level. And they're relevant because we no longer can mitigate enough at the global level so that their, the impacts are reduced at the lower level. Okay. 
Uh, then, uh, Emily, I would like you to help me to address this question from Diana Ruiz to Yomar. Uh, to what extent, uh, please, Lorena, if you can help us, to what extent we can use technology to help social science to create awareness and create new concepts to preserve our mother earth, please. Well, as I was telling you, the technology that does not harm Mother Earth involves recognizing those areas that still have the necessary ecosystems and the necessary minerals that we need to produce our food. We do not need to develop um, new technologies or use technologies that harm our land. The only thing that we need to do is to understand and be aware of the fact that we've always used rotative crops in order to be able to continue harvesting different kinds of crops without harming the earth. Now, in an ecosystem like the one of Bolivia, where we have the necessary land, where we have the necessary know-how, we do not know to invest, and we need not. We do not need to invest any money. The only thing we need is the political will, and in order to be able to rebuild the knowledge that we already have and to share it, and to be able to share the practices where we can grow crops in a, a natural and unharmful way. Now, to answer your question, with the use of technology, we can promote the exchange of goods and services between people that live out in the city and people who live in the countryside so that we can go, um, we can overcome these difficult times and so that producers won't have their crops go bad and so that people won't go hungry. Now, Technology gives us a place of encounter, of exchange, we can, where we can all interact directly without the interference of banks or of other institutions that could um, <coughs> harm us or who could take advantage of us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yomari and Lorena. We go to, uh, the, I think that the last question is from Good News. The, the next one, please, Emily. Uh, how can we achieve a balance in economy, ecology, and society since there has always been a trade-off effect such the environmental <coughs> suffers when we achieve gains in society and economy? Mm -hmm. Scarlett, could you hear us? Uh, yes, more or less. Just let me one second. Mm. 
Okay, so let me see the question to can answer. Mm -hmm. So in this part, <laughs> oh, okay. I understand the, the question, excuse me. But the, um, the time is very expensive, so. Yes, it's a little difficult. Um, well, respect to the, the question, I don't know. How can we achieve a balancing economy, ecology, and society since there has always been a trade off effect such that the environment suffers when we achieve gains? Well, um, I don't know. I think that there are many um, different forms that we can achieve, um, that we can uh, complement this, this goal that I mentioned. But I think that um, or, or it's very difficult to, to achieve about the economy, ecology, and society. But it's possible. It's possible when uh, the effort is collect collected, and I think that the the fundamental is that um, all of us we can know these these objectives uh, because in these objectives we can see that these uh, this growth uh, sustainable is possible is possible and we can change the the reality the, the, we can change uh, the the actually the, the situation the, the actually because it's possible um, i think that some some of the the opportunities that we have is that we can we can the change start for us and for example i always i i think that um we must be a green consumer uh, we can think more about the cycle life of the products we can we can check some sometimes one time of the year uh, the carol food print of each one uh, there, I think that these are the actions that will be a change for the world. Because um, I, I'm encouraging that actually, that currently the environment suffers when we achieve uh, in the, when we try to achieve in the goal society and economy. But I think that um, Always, when we these questions, I I think that a clear example that we can do it is there are some companies like, for example, Nadio that they have a poli politicals and actions that um, could be equality in the south. Between society, sustainable, and economic. This is for my part. Thank you very much, Scarlett. Thank you very much. I think that we are run of time. And thank you for your time, Dr. Eh, Raúl Pacheco Vega, Scarlett Avalco. Muchas gracias, Yomar and Lorena. Lorena for the translation. And well, I hope to see you uh, very soon. So have a nice weekend. And I hope you all in the audience enjoyed the, the speech. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye.